Um, I'm delighted to welcome everyone. We have a trajectory. It's uh, four steps. First, as a Roman historian with an interest in these literatures of war, I will focus my comments on the women in the ancient legend Coriolanus, a time when women were largely unable to participate in war, excepting a few exemplary, probably mythological, Amazons. My talk would be titled, Breasts Not on the Battlefield. But I want to focus on the social roles of the women, Volumnia, Vergilia, and Valeria, and how the ideologies of militarism convinced women not only to abide by, but also to endorse and promote the annual military engagement of the Roman military state. As a professor of politics and WGSS, Brianne Gallagher will focus on the contemporary translation of Coriolanus's militarism as a gendered dynamic of soldiering and militarization on the homeland and the war front in contemporary US warfare. As a Dartmouth undergraduate, military wife, veteran of OEF, reservist, PSYOPs, honors graduate of the JFK Special Warfare Center and School for Advanced Training in PSYOPs, Natalie DeFreitas, whose name I mispronounced and I have for two years and just learned today, so I'll work on it, will focus her comments on her lived experience as a woman soldier in the US military. Finally, our moderator, Vitalia Williams, also a US woman veteran, will give the first response to the talks and will be the moderator for the questions. Um, we think that Coriolanus opens an important discussion on how societies promote and pay for continuous war with expectations on the citizen male and the citizen woman. Our plan is three short presentations, 15, 15, 10 minutes, which will leave lots of time for discussion. Um, and um, some, we just need a good timekeeper, so here I go. Roman militarism was on the backs of Roman women. Volumnia and Shakespeare read, Shakespeare read Plutarch's Coriolanus very carefully. And his presentation of Volumnia and he gives personality, he gives personality and character to what are, are, are very um, superficial characters in Plutarch. Volumnia is an ideal woman. She's made an ideal woman. She's an ideal mother. She instrumentalizes her son. She raises him to be this consummate warrior, defines political ambition for him for politics. In Act One, we meet her, and she defines herself in terms of her son and her son's actions. She becomes male and is proud of it. She has no grief if he dies. She socially excludes herself when he is exiled. She has his anger, and she says in Act Four, I will go home and dine on my anger. I will dine alone. She is rewarded for a political calculus that privileges the Roman state over the life of her own son. In the play, Virgilia, who initially does all the emotional work for the family, who has normal human responses to warfare, tears, fear, anxiety for somebody she loves. She too, by the end of Shakespeare's play, becomes the, the ideological, the embodiment of the ideology of the state that she will sacrifice her own husband for the welfare of Rome. What is interesting is how well Plutarch read. What are the Roman realities behind this? The Roman warfare is conspicuous for its relentlessness. From the very beginning of the Roman state until the end of the Roman Republic, the Roman government went to war every year. Now, for those of us living in an era of continuous warfare, that doesn't sound like something that's significant. But what was significant was a contribution that when we can calculate it, was 17% of the male population deploying on an annual basis. That level of social commitment to warfare over time 
required the entire Roman community to be committed to militarism. And that's what's startling, to watch how the society was molded around the commitments to war. The, and now I have to change. How, how does Rome maintain that commitment? What is the sleight of hand whereby a male commitment to militarism becomes a woman's commitment to militarism, a woman who can't go to war? The women of Rome, when we can document it, their lives were fully engaged with, with the success of the men. Roman women buy into the military values because they are the family when the men are gone. What do we know? Julius Caesar, great commander. Father was dead in 85, which means by the time Julius Caesar was 15, before he even went to war, he had lost his father. He lost his paternal uncle, who died in 90. He lost his uh, cousins, also in the 90s. He lost his uncle Marius in 86. Julius Caesar was raised in a family <clears throat> full of women, not in a family full of men. So how, was the ide how, was, how were the military ideals inculcated? We know that Roman women were valued, were idealized for devotion to their children, for directing their education, for disciplining their sons, and for the strictness with which they raised their sons. And the three women that I would mention to you, and we know them as mothers, Cornelia, the daughter of Scipio Africanus, who raised the Gracchi, Aurelia, who raised Julius Caesar, and Atia, who raised uh, the Emperor Augustus. These women had the ambitions that they translated to their sons. Plutarch got it. That's where he got Volumnia. He got it from Roman history. The other thing I want to emphasize is that we know from the Roman educational system that the Roman men were growing up without their fathers. The Roman declamations, which taught Roman boys how to speak, were the textbooks of the Roman schools. And the stories, the topics within these declamations indicate that Roman boys were educated how to live without a father, how to solve family problems concerning property, concerning the social relationships of their family, concerning the treatment of the women within their family. And, um, these treatises taught them how to live without a male head of household in their lives. And the men were gone because the men were at war. The treatises did not teach Roman law. They taught Roman values, which included a value of living without father. And so education and women filled the gap left by men who deployed or traveled uh, uh, in Rome's diplomatic corps. Volomnia reflects a Roman ideal, inculcating values of militarism and service. The other thing I would like to point out is that Volumnia grieves appropriately. She grieves as a Roman woman, which is to say that she doesn't. In the Punic Wars from 218 to 216, the Roman state lost 100,000 men, 150,000 men in three years. A staggering loss for an ancient state, if you think that 50% infant mortality in the first year, um, the, the challenges of reproducing the population across generations were enormous. How did uh, uh, Rome, during the Hannibalic invasion, with the loss of the men, how did the women behave? Again, history records this because it was crisis, so we can see the women. When the news of Trasimene came in, the second defeat of the war, it's actually the third defeat, but the second, the, the second defeat was a cavalry loss, uh, but the second loss of, of, of legions. The women were surrounding the Senate, and the praetor sent them home. He sent them home with three words, male pugnatum est. It was fought badly, go home. And they did go home. After 216, when they, when they lost foreman Roman legions, 
at the Battle of Cannae. The Roman Senate uh, altered the mourning rites for the Roman women. They changed the rites for uh, uh, mourning the lost males of the family. They had to replenish the, the, man, the men in the Senate. Half of the Senate was dead. They had to replenish the Senate. So you can imagine the women absorbing this loss and being told they could not mourn. And yet, we do not hear of any social problems within the Roman Republic uh, for these defeats. The final thing I would say is you can watch again during this time of crisis, Roman law molds itself around the loss of the men and the role of the women. Roman women required legal guardians. Roman law was changed during the Punic War to allow the Roman state to appoint non-familial male guardians for women, i.e. families had existed that no longer had male family members. So they changed the law rather than changing the military commitment, just so you see. So Volumnia grieves appropriately, and she is anger, uh, she is angry, but she abides by the state and its decisions. She ultimately acts on behalf of the Roman state, and we see this at the end of the play when she says she stops her son, and in stopping her son, she forfeits his life. She says in the beginning of the play, she would rejoice if she lost 11 sons in the service of the state. And what we see at the end of the play is that she loses a son in the service of the state, that absolute loyalty. Um, and I could go on. The last, the last example I would, and we don't read Roman history this way. This is what I think is interesting, is that we read Roman history as the story of the battles, and we tend to erase the stories of the women. I would like to end with one other woman, and this started as a joke in my Roman history class. Um, we were doing the first century BCE, and one of the students said, oh yeah, Servilia, she's Julius Caesar's lover, ha, ha, ha. And, which is true, probably. But what she really is, is a woman who represents the cost of war in the life of a Roman woman. Servilia was born in 104 BCE. By the time she was 14, in 90 BCE, she had lost her mother. The family had divorced. She had lost her stepfather. She had moved in with her uncle, and her uncle was murdered, was politically assassinated. By the time that woman was 14 years of old, she had lost three men who would have been her support in her life. She then, uh, she married. Her husband was killed in battle in 77 BCE. Her son was Brutus. He would kill Caesar, and he too would die in a battle. She married again, she, and she managed to survive. But that woman throughout her life was absorbing the loss of all of these men. And that's the story that we tend not to write. And women, Roman women were on the battlefield because their lives were affected and imprinted by the consequences of those battles on the battlefield. Thank you. And now, Brianne. OK, thanks. Um, well, thank you for having me here. And thanks for. Um, inviting me to be a part of this panel. It's a real honor. And uh, so I just wanted to um, talk a little bit um, broadly about the dominant ideas of masculinity and femininity um, in the military. Can everybody hear me? OK. Uh, and, and I was thinking of this title of breasts on the battlefield, right? And I think that maybe one of the, well, Presumably, one of the ideas that come to mind is women on the battlefield, right? Um, and um, uh, a feminism teaches us, right, that um, what it means to be a man or what it means to be uh, a woman is always a process of becoming, right? That uh, it's not necessarily a natural, right? It's not given. It's not universal. Um, instead, it's always already um, fragile, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a, a woman, and, and it's always capable of becoming undone. 
Uh, and so I wanted to um, invite us, uh, when watching this play, to, to be attentive to those processes um, of femininity and masculinity and when um, they are capable of becoming undone and uh, uh, to share some examples, um, particularly with masculinity in the, in the current um, US military uh, and wars. Uh, uh, Hypermasculinity, I think as many of us know, uh, in contemporary warfare practices uh, is uh, viewed within American culture as um, a rite of passage, right? That uh, boys become men, for instance. Uh, um, uh, but the perceived threat of femininity in the military um, operates as part of that process um, of militarized masculinities and identities. Uh, so for instance, in um, a lot of military training, uh, uh, soldiers will be told to um, you know, stop being a sissy, right? Or stop being a pussy, or be a man and suck it up. Um, uh, what it means to be a woman is constantly referred to, and it's um, what it means to be a woman is constantly degraded, right? Um, to be degraded is to be female. Um, and many American soldiers I found in my research um, uh, find themselves embedded uh, in this system where the dominant ideas of masculinity are partial and contradictory at best, insofar that um, they're unattainable. Uh, Soldiers' bodies and their embodied lives um, never fit nicely um, into these categories of the masculine, um, straight, feminine, gay. Uh, the ambiguities and impossibilities of becoming masculine in the military operates as a disciplinary set of power relations for producing, I argue, obedient soldier bodies. And I wanted to give two examples here. Um, and I, uh, I hope this comes back right to the play as well and to um, our title. But uh, one is a story about a former private um, specialist. He goes by the, his name is Ethan McCord. Uh, and Ethan was on the ground um, at the time of an air raid in Baghdad in 2007. Uh, and during the um, firefight, two wounded children um, were struck by air fire from um, uh, U.S. soldiers, and he went to go help these two wounded children, and his uh, platoon leader told him um, to uh, don't worry about the mother effing kids and to pull security on the rooftop. Uh, and so um, Ethan left the two kids there. He went to pull security on the rooftop, but he came back down and he wound up taking those two children to the side behind his vehicle and helped save their lives and brought them to a hospital afterwards. But um, after the air raid, he went back to the military base and he was really disturbed by what had happened, right? He was shaken, he was shaken up. He had um, blood on his hands still um, from um, being right in the air raid, being caught in the fire and the blood of the two children in his hands and he went to his staff sergeant and he said, um, I need to speak to somebody, right? I'm having a hard time grappling with this. Um, I'd like to speak maybe to one of the, the mental health specialists that's on the base. And um, his staff sergeant told him to get the sand out of your vagina, soldier, um, and to suck it up. Uh, and if he didn't, right, suck it up, that there is going to be repercussions for that. Uh, and when I first heard this story, um, this was, Ethan tells his story now to audiences, but it was also um, in the Nation magazine. Um, and I kept on thinking of that phrase, um, stop being a PTSD pussy and get the sand out of your vagina, soldier, and, and how that feminized language, right, that, um, that shaming of what it means to be a woman, um, how powerful that can be as a speech act in the military. And I think that here we see how Ethan McCord, and I think with many other soldiers as a pattern, right? It's not just Ethan's story, but a pattern of many soldiers is that um, he literally loses his balls, right? <laughs> he becomes a woman. He loses his balls when he, right, tries to express his grief, tries to express his feelings. Um, 
One of the patterns that I found is that when many soldiers challenge the chain of command, right, um, when they challenge the authority of the military chain of command, often that involves a process of feminizing soldiers um, to suck it up, to not be a pussy. Um, and so it's in this sense um, that uh, <clears throat> these speech acts, right, of, of feminizing soldiers, of what it means to be a woman, right, um, op operates as a disciplinary tactic. Uh, that, that what it means to be a man is um, uh, unattainable to the extent that um, uh, one could easily be coded as a woman, right? Um, and therefore not a real, you know, soldier. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit about that sense, right, of breasts on the battlefield on, and um, thinking about these dominant ideas of, of feminization, what it means to be feminine. Uh, for women and men. Uh, and the second example that I wanted to provide is um, similar but a little bit different, and uh, it's the story of Cindy Sheehan. Uh, I don't know if anybody is familiar with um, Cindy Sheehan, uh, a war activist and mother of Casey Sheehan. Her uh, son died in Iraq in 2004. Uh, she was one military mom amongst other military families who spoke out against uh, the war when, uh, before her son was killed, but also um, when he was killed with other military families. She addressed uh, President Bush, and uh, she went to his uh, ranch, actually, in Crawford, uh, just outside of Crawford, Texas, in early uh, August of 2005, and Perhaps unlike the, the good grieving woman, right? Um, Cindy Sheehan, I guess, could be the, the troublesome woman, right? She was the troublesome mother who questioned the legitimacy um, of, of why her son died in the Iraq war. Uh, and she uh, asked uh, the president uh, what was um, the, um, the honor Right? What was the, why did her son have to die and what was it for? Um, <clears throat> and when we look at the ways that the feminization of grief and the feminization of trauma comes not through just through shaming what it means to be a woman, um, shaming weakness um, with vulnerability, right? As if to show one's emotions and expressions of grief is a weakness rather than a strength, right? It could be a strength, it could be perceived as a strength. Uh, grieving is also very much feminized insofar that it takes place within the private sphere of the home often. Uh, the invisible, unpaid, gendered care labor of mothers and wives and girlfriends and daughters and aunties and grandmothers uh, who are called upon, and men too, right? But, but a lot of women who are called upon by dominant cultural norms and the military in and of itself through different policies and outreach programs um, to take care of wounded soldiers coming back from the wars. Uh, and that grief often takes place, I think as Professor Stewart is alluding to in the play, it, it's often rendered invisible. It's, it's not the center story <laughs> in a lot of the homecoming narratives. Um, or in a lot of the stories that we might see in the dominant media of, of war films, uh, the, the feminization of care labor, of taking care of soldiers coming home from the wars. And so by Cindy Sheehan taking that privatized grief um, and stepping out and making it public, right, and showing, no, that my grief is actually political, and I'm not going to be the good, right, military mom and be quiet and, and, and suck it up, and I'm, I'm actually going to talk about my son's death, and I'm going to talk to others, and I'm going to make it public. Uh, so with that said, uh, uh, I think that with the play, uh, it could be interesting in that sense to, to be thinking, right, too about women soldiers, right, and what it means to be a woman warrior and a male warrior, but also um, those those processes of becoming, right, a male soldier for women, <laughs> the the fears of not being seen um, to be manly enough, uh, the fears of being a man or trying to be a man, right, and then being called a woman and that that shaming process. It's this constant power struggle, right? Uh, and, 
and politically um, what it would mean within a, a time where we're in the global war on terror, the endless continuous global war on terror that's now the, the longest um, US-led war officially, uh, in a time of endless war where we see so much militarization on the home front right, and the war front, uh, even though it's not an official war here, right? For many Americans, it's still a lot of wars, <laughs> right? Um, school shootings take place almost every month. Uh, how can we begin to talk about that grieving process of emotions, right? Without it becoming something that needs to be hushed and silenced and hidden. Um, how can we look at grief and our emotions and feelings not as weaknesses, but as strengths. How can vulnerability in that sense be a strength rather than a perceived weakness as well? Um, and perhaps that is a way to think about resistance um, because um, if we can uh, right, hold on to grief and talk about it <laughs> and, and talk about how we all become undone at times, um, then that's perhaps a way of unraveling, um, right, a process of unraveling militarism as well. So. All right, can everyone hear me? Okay, let's see if I can get that. So um, my name's Natalie DeFridis. I'm a 20 here, an undergraduate student. I'm a veteran. Um, I served in the United States Army Reserves as a psychological operations specialist, which is most similar to like marketing and advertising, just to a foreign audience on behalf of the United States military. Um, and I served a year in Afghanistan. So I'm hoping this evening to relay just some of my experiences and thoughts as a soldier reading Coriolanus um, and kind of relating it back to my reality. Um, but before I begin, I just want to say that although I've lived it, I certainly don't understand it all. Um, and so with that in mind, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about how I think Coriolanus is relatable to the military today. And I thought I could do that through a chronology, like a timeline of my own service. Um, so looking at when I joined, um, when I joined the Army, I did it for a lot of reasons. Um, I did it because I wanted to change myself. I wanted to be a better version of me. I wanted to toughen up. I wanted to better equip myself to face life's challenges and to come through them to the other side. Um, these are all characteristics that at the time I really did see as masculine. And for the most part, the Army fulfilled its commitment to me there. Uh, <laughs> I was able to, to toughen up a little bit. In a nutshell, you could say that I really wanted to be more like Coriolanus. Um, many of the same traits that I was looking to gain from the Army, we see that Coriolanus and his mother value highly in the play. Um, Coriolanus is an amazing warrior, and he just does things that other people simply can't do. He is fearless on the battlefield, and his mother claims a type of fearlessness too. I wouldn't say the Army made me fearless, but I think it teaches a lot of people to kind of push through discomfort um, or fear, um, at least not to, to freeze up. Um, with that idea in mind, trying to be a little more like Coriolanus has something to do with why I deployed. Uh, my unit was mostly men, and many of them had actually deployed multiple times. Um, from Iraq to Afghanistan and just different theaters. And I was told from my training days on that I would never be able to understand my job until I deployed. And so, um, you know, in my unit, you could tell who had deployed, you can tell with any soldier, you wear it on your uniform on your day to day. Um, and, you know, we know this from the medals we earn too. And to me, that's a lot like Coriolanus and his body and the wounds that he displays in the play. They, they're like a, a walking resume for him, like almost like his dress uniform of everything that's happened to him in the military from the beginning to the end. Um, so me walking around my unit deployment patchless, uh, it felt like a problem to me and I, I couldn't help myself. I wanted to be like the guys. I wanted to feel like I could measure up. And the first opportunity I got, I volunteered for a deployment. So then I found myself in Afghanistan, and while I was deployed, I was again surrounded by men. Um, and being a woman, despite the baggy uniform and the bulky gear that we stack on, I did stick out to other soldiers. Um, but the Afghan people I talked to were a little less certain that I was, if I was female or male, it was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> women were like not sure they were, they were gonna talk to me or not. Um, so for a while I continued to try to emulate the guys and um, 
Over time, I found that while certain masculine traits were certainly helpful to me as a soldier, they wouldn't ultimately secure my success on a deployment and in my missions and in my job and as an individual. Um, and I see this reality reflected in the character of Volumnia. Volumnia is undeniably female. I mean, she's a mother, um, and that's central to the play. But she also displays a lot of masculine traits like Professor Stewart um, talked about. She encourages her son in his military career. When he returns home, and this really stuck out to me, she doesn't cry. Um, or at least we don't know. She, <laughs> we don't see it. Um, and with that way, her character really reminded me a lot of the female soldiers that I've met. She's strong, she's determined, and she's mission-oriented. She isn't the kind of woman to cry when her son comes home from war. She's the kind to count his scars. In fact, the more the better, and if he can add some oak garlands to that or a title, that would be great. Um, and this reaction really, really did stick, stick out to me um, because I prided myself, and I knew a lot of women that did, um, of never crying in front of another soldier. Um, that was a private thing. Never displayed that. <laughs> and it was a source of pride for me at the time. Um, and actually, this was advice I got from another female soldier, uh, a woman that actually kind of reminds me of Volumnia. And instead of showing any kind of feminine emotion, uh, Volumnia is hungry to hear that her son has more wounds and a new title. Um, in modern terms, like, how many medals did you earn? Um, but while Volumnia employs skills that Coriolanus doesn't have, or at least hasn't maybe had the opportunity to foster, uh, she's successful because of her ability to communicate and navigate social landscapes, at least from what I read. And she leans into her individual strengths, and this is how she really thrives. Today, the Army has a saying that reminds me of the attributes of Coriolanus and Volumnia kind of combined. You hear it a lot, it's shoot, move, communicate. Um, and each skill is absolutely necessary for a soldier. With this saying, I, Volumnia reminds me of how I found success while I was deployed. I really leaned into my individual strengths as a soldier. I relied heavily on my ability to communicate and understand the interpersonal relationships around me. Um, and together, with our differing strengths, the, the other soldiers around me and I, we formed a unit and we accomplished our mission. In other words, it wasn't ultimately by being more male that I was successful. It was by recognizing what made me different and what I was good at by being my female self, and that helped me find success. And Volumini finds her success in her own way, too. Volumini is not a soldier. She can't shoot or move like her son, but she eclipses him in when it comes to communication. She leverages her skills through her um, dominance over his life, and her son almost makes it to the consulship of Rome. Uh, she advises him, giving him the words that he needs to say to gain power and appease the crowds. And Volumni is accompanied by other members of um, Coriolanus' family, when they all get together, they actually save Rome. They save all of Rome uh, through her ability to persuade. And when I think about the power of persuasion in warfare and the importance of words for the modern soldier, I can't help think about Volumnia as a kind of warrior. And I like to think that if Volumnia could come into existence today and just like appear in front of us, uh, that she'd be earning her own medals instead of sending her son out to earn them for her. Because I think in a lot of ways, Volumnia was a hero in the play. Uh, certainly in a number of lives she saved in Rome. But we can learn from the play that war isn't only brute force. It also has words. It isn't just about being the strongest. It's also about being the best communicator, which is why the Army created jobs like mine, psychological operations, and a plethora of others that really focus on communication and warfare. Um, but at the end of the day, she isn't successful by being male. It's by displaying male characteristics when it suits her and utilizing her individual and unique skills in communication uh, that she ultimately finds success. That said, in the place she does send her son to war and then her son has to come home. And homecoming for Coriolanus is an event wherein he is expected to relive his war stories, accept recognition and display his wounds, and he doesn't want to participate in any of it. Uh, today we recognize that there's more than one type of war wound. There's the visible ones that Coriolanus has in the play, and there's invisible ones, like maybe psychological trauma. However, like in the play, when I came home, I felt like it, I was expected to have some kind of war wound. And to this was added the assumption of sexual trauma that sometimes is made of female soldiers. But the truth is not everyone comes back wounded. What is true to the play is the reality that some people want to talk about their wounds and other people don't. The reality is seen in the scene where Coriolanus stands feeling naked in front of people with the expectation that he will display his wounds. And that really made an impression on me. 
it's one of the most, to me, it's one of the most absolutely deep and complicated moments in the entire play, uh, with a depth of emotion that I think is really difficult to truly understand. And while I can't say I understand that moment fully, I can say that I do understand what it feels like to not be completely comfortable telling a war story or an aspect of military service. And that kind of makes me think about the war story and how it's conveyed and who can tell it and who gets to hear it and the fact that this is something we do struggle with today. And for the reasons I've already described and so many others, I really think that Coriolanus is a play, the themes and controversies that are really relevant today. Um, it addresses many of the realities of the modern soldier. And there's a focus on accomplishment, masculinity, and wounds. In the play, the roles of women and the differing responses to the realities of homecoming are on display, even sending a family member to war. There's also the masculine woman who thrives in her military world, but is still undeniably female and a hero in her own right. That's all I've got. Thank you. <laughs> and so our, our takeaway, we have a takeaway. That is, in all of these talks, we've been talking about a play. We've been talking about a piece of the humanities. Oops. The takeaway, right? We've been talking about a play. We've been talking about a piece of literature. And I think in this play, we see how the humanities transcend the centuries and their ability to intervene productively in important conversations of our world. The military-civilian divide, the hyper-masculinity uh, hyper of warrior societies, the role of women who support those societies. And so we thank you for your attention and we're gonna open it up. Just a quick response. Um, I really like the idea of Volumnia as, you know, uh, trying to imagine her in the 20th century mm -hmm. because I think that's an appropriate, you know, conclusion to draw. I don't think Volumnia, Volumnia would be at home raising Marines. I think Volumnia would be or would try to be a Marine. I, I like that idea. Um, I think Volumnia was occupying a space that she had to fill at that point in time in history, but she very likely was just as angry and had the capacity for violence and had the capacity to protect the things that she cared about just as much as the men did, um, which is, you know, a the struggle right now of just about every woman in the military is to kind of fight for the right to def defend the things that men have been defending for a very, very long time. So um, at this point, does anybody have any questions for the panel? Hi, this question is geared towards Professor Gallagher, but I'd also like to um, hear responses from the other two. So uh, my name is Sean Gaynor. I am also a Dartmouth 20, and I'm also a Marine Corps veteran. Um, I grew up in a hyper-masculine environment raised by uh, uh, two very uh, masculine women. Um, my aunt, the prison guard, and my mother, the 40-year uh, electrician. Um, I grew up on a farm. I grew up riding rough stock. Um, I grew up um, going to welding and shop class and learning how to use my hands and learning how to use my body to um, work, to do work. Mm -hmm. um, and so femininity was never something that was really put in my face until I joined the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. um, the Marine Corps I thought it was going to be like shop class. I thought it was going to be like FFA, where I was just going to go into this environment and be one of the guys and be able to use my body to do work. And that was not the case. Um, almost immediately, um, I was the female. And I was stationed in 29 Palms, which has a very uh, low um, population of women. And so I was kind of idolized as a female, a position I'd never before been in in my life. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was very interesting. So I go from being um, this kid, this hyper-masculine tomboy, mm -hmm. to um, being this idolized woman, although, you know, that's not what the Marine Corps wanted. They, they, don't, they don't want women. But because I was a 
rare commodity. I was idolized by my, my peers, and it ended up uh, being something that I really struggled with. So, um, Professor Gallagher, my question to you is, um, do you think that in, in, in a way that Ms. DeFreitas um, uh, referenced that, that you're forced to be masculine, but I feel more like I was forced to be feminine in the military. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing. And uh, um, I think that your, your story and your experience um, speaks to all of the different ways, right, of what it means to be masculine, be woman, can take shape and take place if there's no like universal experience, right? Um, and uh, I guess I, I was just thinking of how, um, you know, um, uh, the ways that uh, femininity and masculinity um, become attached to these particular signs and symbols, right? So, like, for instance, I, I'm thinking about when, uh, and I'm not looking at, like, racial and class differences at all here. I'm just kind of using these terms really broadly. And, um, but when girls are, are young, right, and maybe um, they are considered like tomboys, right? Um, like, uh, oh yeah, she likes climbing trees and she likes doing this, and it's kind of applauded, right? Um, it's not a problem necessarily, I don't think, in American culture at least, but when girls, I mean, I'm sorry, when boys, right, um, are more girl-like, right? And dress in like dresses or, or tutus, right? <laughs> or dolls, all of a sudden it, it's a problem, right? Um, and, and they become feminized. And, and I think that that speaks a lot to the power dynamics of patriarchy and, and these hierarchies, right? Is that it's, um, why would a, a, a boy or a man want to give up that masculinity and, 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 and become like a woman? But it's okay for a girl or a woman to want to become like a man. Um, and that's because of that patriarchal framework, right? Um, and, and so I don't know how to, to respond and kind of like fit it all in a box, right? But, but, but it is to say that gender is troubling and it's messy and it's complicated, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, perhaps, I, I don't know how you feel, I'd love to talk afterwards, you know, but um, maybe, uh, you know, um, your, your tomboyishness was unexpected, or, right? Um, in terms of the, the group of pe people that you were amongst, or um, maybe uh, that wasn't the expected gendered presentation, or um, uh, does anybody else want to share on that? Professor Stewart or others? I can as well. I can Do I need the button? Yeah. Do you hear me? I, I think that what's really interesting is that we're talking about, I, I think that women were, in Rome, very, very strong. Mm. I don't think there was an ounce of weakness in managing to hold families together when the men are gone all the time, and you're having to manage the economy of a household, mm. and you're having to raise the children, and you're having to, to see to education and oversee all of that. Mm. That is... And, and people are dying. You, you know, most Romans at the age of 20, 60% of the population would not have had a father at the age of 20. So the family, there's an enormous strength in the people who are holding these families together, which are the women. And that strength is not being called strength. What's being identified as strength is going out into the battlefield. And I, I get that there's a life and death struggle. And Aristotle says that the truest form of Andrea is going into battle because it's the life and death struggle. Sports don't even count, right? Sports don't count because it's not the life and death struggle. But I would say, and in terms of commitment, endurance, resilience, you know, eye on the mission, that's what these women had in spades. 
You know, Roman society stuck together and was an empire because the women did this. And, and I think that it's interesting that we value what we, we say that there's one sphere where the strength is shown, right? And, and I just have to put that out there because I think that, that the women who are single moms, because that's what we're really talking about. Mm -hmm. if, if, you know, I mean, initially the Roman army deployed every year. So they went out in March, they came back in October, and, and they were at home. But starting in around 153 BCE, give or take a few minutes, right? Because it's the ancient world, so the dates are kind of funky. But, but around 150 BCE, we know with deployments to the Spains, they're there long term. Mm. They're there long term. And, and which means that women are holding this society. Women are doing that, and that's strong. That's, that's strong. It's not strong that's valued in the same way. I mean, that's what's interesting is that Volumnia is as tough as nails as her son. She just shows it in a different context. They have the same quality. And, you know, we say, oh, she's so male, mm -hmm. right? But the reality is, you know, he's just like his mother. Let's say it. You know, he's just like his mother. And, and it, it's interesting how we value that. We, cr we just, we perpetuate these discourses. Do you, do you, does that make any sense? Go ahead. Question. Um, that's a pretty strong statement there to say Sorry. strong like mom, right? Um, I don't know. I think all of us would look at our moms as strong people probably. Um, and it's strange to see how that's reflected in warlike societies as not so similar. Um, I did see another question over here. Thank you. By the way, Roberta, your comment is uh, really impactful, not only in Roman society, but through all warring uh, societies where the women kept the country functioning. Yeah, it's very, very, very good thought. We should think about that more when we think of history or study history. Um, I, I had a question. Um, you, you kind of answered it. So my question was going to be what motivates women to join the military uh, and become a soldier? You kind of answered it, well, uh, and you, you, would, you gave some personal reasons. You wanted to better yourself in different ways, and bettering, when a person betters themselves, they tend to help society as well, and it makes society stronger. So, so that's admirable. But was there any feeling of uh, going out to do the right thing for the country, to defend the country, or to follow the right international program? Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, there's about a million reasons I could probably cite for why I wanted to join. Yeah, and, and part of it was like a sense of patriotism and duty. Um, it's just the truth. Uh, and part of it was toughening up, being more like a guy a little bit. I really, that was attractive to me at the time. Um, and, and uh, well, you know, 9-11 was a part of it. That happened when I was in middle school, and I remember it made a big impact on me. So that, I think that's kind of most of it. Um, but the world was kind of a big, scary place for me at that age, and I didn't really know what to do or how to navigate it. So I thought this would help me kind of figure that out. Vitalia might know. She might have another reason. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I did three years of undergrad at another school and left um, because I was bored, um, because I didn't think school was interesting. And I went and did a couple of things in the civilian world where, um, you know, you, you kind of just try to make it on your own. Part of it was curiosity. Part of it was defying my mom saying that I would, you're not gonna do well without a college degree. Um, and she was right. Um, and so I kind of ended up in a space where I didn't really know what was going on in my life. And I know that there are some people who at 17 with a waiver from their parents join the military and kind of know that that's what they want to do. And then I know some people kind of find their way to it for a lack of options. And so I was one of those people. I'd, both of my parents are retired from the military, so one would assume that I had a really, really strong patriot factor. I didn't really, um, at least not initially. I joined the military because it, you know, it was always an option in my family. It just wasn't my first option. Um, what I would say now after five years in the military is I couldn't tell you what made me join outside of necessity. What I would tell you now is that it's kind of one of the formative 
things or experiences in my life and that as a female I was very quiet. Um, I didn't trust my voice. I didn't think I had anything really worth listening to or saying. And the military kind of, one, taught me that I need to fight for it in an environment of male dominance. And then two, I have actually kind of rejected this notion um, of kind of, I know we have a lot of struggles in our country right now, but my experiences in the military have been mostly positive, um, up to and including experiences with my peers, my male peers. Um, and in a time in our country where someone would probably tell you to be afraid, um, I think there's a lot more good out there than bad. And so for me, I couldn't tell you a bunch of nice stuff about why I joined, which is a little unfortunate, but there's a lot of good side effects that came out of it, especially without someone being super patriotic before they joined. Um, I'll take one more question. My understanding is, my name is Carter Dodge and I served in the Air Force. My understanding is that even in, uh, especially in our military, there are a lot more support jobs that support killers than killers themselves. And how is this need for large number of people where technical excellence is much more important than a willingness to risk their own lives. How has that changed military culture compared to a Roman time when I assume there were a lot more people directly on the battlefield as a percentage ready to shed blood? Um, I would just say, Carter, though, that I think that one of the points I was trying to make, and maybe I didn't make it so clearly because I tried to do 50 minutes in 15, is that all of society was standing behind the people in that battle line. That that battle line couldn't have stood just as the US military today couldn't stand. That Roman, the entire Roman society was organized to make possible that battle line. You know, it was Roman law changed the values of the family changed, the educational system changed, the economy was structured in a particular way. So we see more, you see, I think you're talking about the more direct support, but what I really think is important, and I think it's important for today that we think about it, is that we, we have to think about militarism and it's, its location within society, its, its social location, its economic location, and to recognize that every aspect of the society makes that possible in its form. And so today, what, what our government has done is it's tried to move it as far to the margins as it can, you know, and, and it's, it's tried to move it as far to the margins as it can. But in fact, it's still part of this social structure and we should be asking, what is that marginalization done to the definition of citizenship? What is that marginalization done to the character of our political discourse? What is that marginalization done to the institutions that feed and develop our foreign policy? I do all that in history. Right, so I can see it very clearly and I can tell you it's there. And so what I want it, you know, what I try to invite you to do and what I try to invite my students to do is to take those, those lessons from history and use them, not for answers, but as, for as, as tools to understand this, this today's framework. But, you know, we're supporting the U.S. military right now, right? We, we are supporting the U.S. military in its structure and its endeavors. I know that's not what you're saying, but I just had to say that to you. Oh, I think that was a great answer. <laughs> I guess I would say that um, there will always be people that have to be willing to die for our country. Now, to imply that people in those support roles wouldn't be willing to or didn't sign up to make the same sacrifice, I think that would be a false equivalent, but um, it's happening less. I mean, there, there's something there to say that most of, we're not fighting traditional warfare anymore, which requires different levels of expertise. It requires people, you know, literate, 
with computers. It requires people to explore the psychology of marketing. Um, it explore, it ha there's a little bit more of an intellectual leverage now on your everyday soldier. And so while I don't think that there's, you know, a, a huge um, separation with regards to the military, I would say that those who don't deploy in the same capacity as some of the people we see um, as heroes in American culture, um, there's still a little bit of insecurity about those people and those support roles that won't be able to fulfill that expectation of being an American patriot. Um, but I, I definitely think that it also makes a lot more room for women in certain roles as well that didn't exist before. I, can I add to it? Yeah. yeah. I, I think too that um, when I think of these d additional technical roles, like as compared to Roman times and today, um, I, we have now, uh, what, less than 1% of the U.S. population who is enlisted in the U.S. military. So um, while, while that's the case, there is, um, at the same time, more U.S. soldiers because of postmodern battlefield spaces, because of new technologies and rehabilitation technologies, more soldiers are surviving injuries that in previous wars would have been fatal. So there's more soldiers returning with injuries, which there's more bureaucracies, right? And we can't really talk about that without the military industrial complex, right? All of um, the, the ways that um, uh, not just deploying soldiers in the military and drones and so forth and drone warfare and the home front and war front takes place, but the, um, the, yeah, the, 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 the returns that are brought from that, right? And, um, and again, I think that brings us back to the feminization of care labor because, um, again, it's often the women, <laughs> right, who are called upon to take care of um, um, those who are returning with injuries. And, and the other thing I was thinking of is, um, you know, in uh, technical roles, right, this is a gendered usage of a term, I think, right, because, like, female combat medics, right, might, um, are often attached to a convoy, uh, which is attached, right, a medical unit attached to a convoy. But one of the most dangerous places to be in Iraq and Afghanistan is on the road, right, because then you're, if I'm correct, susceptible, right, to IED strikes and so forth. And so you are also a moving target as, like, technical medical support. Um, and many women um, were in those positions before they could officially engage in combat roles, right? So um, even that notion of what it means to be um, in combat and not in combat, right, based on your actual position um, in the current wars is gendered, right? And it becomes blurred when we actually look at, like, who's, right, um, in a line of fire. And also for, for men and women who, who are also... Um, the line of, of militarism and of war, right, can also be, well, we can look at bodies too, um, where for many women's bodies can become, right, battlegrounds as well. Um, and I just feel like that's important to say, right, because it kind of, I think, brings us back to, to the bodily experience, right, that no matter what position one is in within the military, um, our title or our role doesn't necessarily mean that um, it, it lays to a particular experience. Okay, mm -hmm. so we've been told that we have time for one more question. Okay, I see one back here. Hi, my name's Jim Harlow. Um, this is more of an observation and maybe a recommendation. I'm retired Army, I did 22 years, and uh, one thing I noticed in Roberta's torture classes, she seemed to like to torture some of us veterans with Shakespeare, mm. <laughs> but we thank her for it. I noticed something in the classes. When we had females in the class, when it was veterans in the class, they started explaining almost apologetically why they joined the military. And I'm asking you, stop doing that. Your service was as good as any of ours, but you ask a ranger, Marines, 
first place, we don't ask why they joined. They joined. They came on board to do a mission. Don't apologize. If anybody asks you, just say, because I wanted to. That will cure that problem. Next, <laughs> being, I, I was drafted in the first 15 years, I was in what's called combat arms. We couldn't have women in our units. And what a shock to my system when I eventually got put into a target acquisition unit that had females in it. And the first thing I did was see a female walking with a helmet on the back of her head, and I said, put that damn helmet on your head, right? And it was like, oh boy, what happened here? I had to evolve. I had to change my way of soldiering some, and I did it with the help of the people in the unit. They had not been trained correctly. I had the information they needed. Our problem was communications. And I would not have made it in the Army if I didn't have a strong woman next to me. My wife, civilian, was with me when I went back in the Army. And one day I went out the door, said goodbye, thought I'd be home that night. I didn't come home for five months. Now, I had, uh, my daughter was very young at the time. We were in a foreign country. If you don't have strong, supporting people around you, I wouldn't have made it. I simply wouldn't have made it. And I had one of those personalities, if they say go, I'm gone. I was ready to go all the time. And, uh, but I thank you for that. But don't ever have to explain why you joined. They never ask us. You don't have to explain it either. But you're not alone. It was just something I had noticed, and I think Bill noticed it too from something you said. Well, you taught me something tonight. I didn't know that you didn't get asked that. <laughs> she should have been wearing her helmet the right way, though. I agree. I agree. <laughs> So, okay, so it looks like we're done right now for the open panel, but I'm sure a, a few of us will be sticking around if you guys have questions. Um, I do know that there are a few veterans here from the community, and I'd love the opportunity to meet with you. I'm sure some of the people on the panel would as well.